Yes, good, thank you. So uh, Aviv, Sarah, and Padma already outlined, I think, a lot of the things what we might possibly do with the Human Cell Atlas. Um, I'm gonna say what you will do with the atlas, right? Um, I mean, we've all been interested in everything from the molecular scale to how these things make cells, how cells sit in tissues, right? And then uh, how those local niches, for instance, then form the tissues. I look at the human cell atlas as a place where all of our data can reside. Right? I think humans have two brains, at least, hopefully. One is the visual cortex, right, which processes information up front. Uh, we think of things visually. We don't think of them as Excel spreadsheets. Uh, we think of tissues, at least right now, as cells uh, in some three-dimensional context in space. But obviously what we want to do with something like the cell atlas is to provide a home and a coordinate system within which all of the kinds of data that we're interested uh, in developing and using can live. But not just obviously a, a static system. Right, because you know, there's many ways of saying this, and religions across the world uh, and philosophers have used the same kind of idea, is that the universe has really no meaning in the present. It really only has meaning in the future or when you look at it from uh, some future historical context. And similarly, cellular states really have very little function in the present. Uh, their function is defined by future context and environments in which they are going to find themselves. And as Aviv nicely put it, uh, you have these cellular states where are actually searching uh, for uh, what their future might be, right, as uh, sets of, uh, of cellular states, right? So really what the Atlas is doing at the beginning, at least for, for me, or at least my aspirational interest in it, uh, is that we're preparing for multiple futures. We're going to be starting with what is known, right, and uh, with normal, and then uh, we're going to look at and use that uh, depending upon the disease states. So something was, has been asked a couple of times, questions already, right? Uh, while we're beginning with RNA, uh, we already know that there's an awful lot of protein information, that while the proteome, as measured in a, cell, in a, uh, a spatial context, is nowhere near as deep, for instance, as what you can achieve with RNA, there's a granularity of placement of cellular proteins within the spatial coordinates even of a cell that has valuable information that we can still uh, gain access to at the beginning. And we can do a lot more, I think, at least with certain of those proteins in terms of looking at the cellularity and the state and then mapping RNA into whatever that meaning might be. So I look at this as a multiple different kinds of coordinate systems, depending upon the organ, depending upon the cell type, depending upon its place, and as you'll see, uh, the neighborhoods in which we're going to be finding. So we need to know what is known, and then we're going to be using this to know what needs to be known. And it's not just a list. And I think that one of the efforts for the computational community here uh, that we have to do is how do we turn this into a mnemonic, right? How do we create things uh, and an approach that allows people to easily visualize and think about it and not be scared away by the computation? Right, I mean, I think if you know some of the best uh, individuals who are good at memorizing systems, you know how they actually do it? They walk through, uh, say, their home and they put the things that they're trying to remember in places in that home, right? So we need to build, I think, that into the computation that we're gonna be uh, applying here in the future. Right, so, but then again, it's not just about the places, right, that the cells are in. Uh, one of the things that we've started to work on a lot in my laboratory are the intercellular relationships. We're discovering that, as I'll show a little bit later, uh, that not only are the cells present in any given individual neighborhood, but there are relationships between cells across the system that can be discovered, and that yet, and they need to be uh, understood, named, uh, and, uh, put into some form of meaning. So there's inter-tissue as well, relationships that need to be done. The cell niches and modules, as I'll show you in a minute. And then something which we've been starting to think about as virtual cell types, right? That there's these modules are not just one cell works with another, but that together they actually are accomplishing something that, they, that without the other, they are nothing. Right, so, uh, and if you go into physics, you can find a lot of these kinds of concepts as well, the whole concept of virtual 
particles, so we've got virtual uh, cell types as well. So uh, to me, at least, it's not just that a cell can be many things, it's why is it many things, right? And I think it's really sampling reality, right? It's sampling the state space because at one point in time it will need to do something and it can't be everything at once, so therefore it's sampling reality. Uh, and that's a way for uh, uh, basically biology to be many things at once. Um, and I think that the development of a map like this really shouldn't ignore thousands of years of history, right? There's traditional uh, medicines that have told us something that we're learning now, right, uh, about, the, about the body and how it interacts. And so everything from acupuncture to uh, traditional medicines, I think, are going to be have a very nice home uh, in a visual map of the system. Right, so for me at least, uh, again, I, I often say in defense of proteins, right, uh, visualize tissue at multi-scale resolutions, right? We already now have systems, and I think by the end of this summer we'll have about a dozen out into the, into the community and then probably a dozen a month after that now, uh, where we can look right down to the cellular scale at multiple different proteins. So everything that we've been able to do with CYTOF, we can now do uh, with uh, visualization, not only in 2D, but also in 3D. Right, so some of you will already know, say, of the various clarity techniques and Ron Germain's work where these kinds of three-dimensional deep tissue imaging approaches can be done. Here, Ron has been doing it with four to six proteins and uh, we've recently succeeded with Ron now to take our codex system and begin to apply it here. Right, so we'll be able to do 50, 60 proteins at 200 to 300 nano, 300, um, uh, depth, what's the what, micron depth, right, of the of tissue. So no more doing tissues slices at a time and then trying to align them. You can actually look at the, t at the tissue in, in context. So that, I think, will come relatively soon, right? But it's not just about the cells and where they are. It's what's going on inside of them. So we already know that there are super resolution techniques that uh, can be achieved to look, in our case, we're using MIBI to look at the 50 or so nanometer scale uh, directly at chromatin and proteins and things within the cell. There are, of course, fluorescence versions of these kinds of techniques. And then layer on top of this the opportunities that Ed Boyden's expansion microscopy is opening. And I think really the sky's the limit that we can go from the smallest of the scale to the largest. And again, it comes back to the community here, right, the computational community to help Help us take pretty pictures and turn them from data, information, knowledge, wisdom up the up that scale, right? Um, and then, as I said, it's it's we're we're now easily for in a single day we can do extraordinary depth, 50, 60 markers at a time, 200,000 cells in Z resolution scale. Uh, and every time you look at something like this, uh, you realize that you have the ability not only to know what those cells are, but then to to automate the finding of what those cells are. So again, we've just begun this, but we don't for a minute in my lab believe that we're going to solve. These, all of these problems. We're just trying to, to serve up uh, to the community at large so that the creativity of the community uh, will be able to come to bear on this, where we can automatically now find the cell types across disease progression and find new cell types that are forming, and not only cell types, right, but novel neighborhoods, right, cells that are coming together uh, only in a disease state, but not in the, uh, in the normal. And as Aviv and Padma uh, nicely called out, the notion that uh, the perturbation uh, of, for instance, the immune system is really only what tells you what the, uh, what the reason the immune system was there in the first place. So we've begun with simple, let's say, uh, neighborhood analysis, right? Where we'll take an index cell in the center, figure out who its neighbors are, and then we'll say, how many times does that motif recur? How many times do you find that kind of modules across the whole system? And does the order matter? And of course, one cell can belong to many neighborhoods. It doesn't mean that one cell is the index and everybody is, is aligning and orbiting around that cell. You have this movable virtual cell type, right, that uh, has to be understood. 
Um, and so there's the simple ways of indexing it. There's also obviously other kinds of neural net algorithms that can say, I don't care where the beginning and the end of a cell is, I'm just going to look at the pattern of information, right? And again, there's people here in the community that can bring their talents to bear to automate the finding of the neighborhoods and the niches here. And again, we've begun some of this. I think it's more about, for, from my point of view, showing what the opportunities are rather than to say that we've got all of the answers. Um, and so we've done this kind of an approach now for just the tissue and the spleen, where we can, every one of those dots doesn't represent a cell. It actually represents a type of neighborhood which is found in a recurring manner across all of the spleen, right? And then the neighborhoods are joined via a force-directed map to other neighborhoods that they're connected to. And you can find within there, but if you look, uh, as you'll see in a moment, how, uh, what the various known compartments are that are historically understood, but we find novel neighborhoods as well. Right, and so you can look at all of those neighborhoods and you can say, okay, well, where are the B cells in those neighborhoods, right? So that's, all of those up there are the B cells, right? The marginal zone cells, that's not gonna work. The marginal zone cells are here, right? The follicular dendritic cells are there and the T cells are there. B cells are found in many neighborhoods, right? But what we've now understood is that, what's fascinating, is that if you look at the marker expression, right, of the 15 or so proteins that you might use to call out what a given type of B cell is, and then you look not at the global level of expression or the average level of expression, you find actually extremely subtle, but, and sometimes not so subtle, reproducible changes in the expression states of those proteins depending upon the neighborhood in which they reside. So a B cell is not a B cell is not a B cell anymore. A B cell we have to think, and again, this is how, what is the metadata that we're going to use here to discover what the different kinds of B cells are that are really that are really dependent upon or should be named in the neighborhoods in which they find themselves, right? And then this other notion as well is that you know we're not going to take one human and use them as the beginning, right? Or all of the map variation is a feature. Right, it's not a bug, right? We've now shown many times, uh, and at least with the protein expression uh, or the cell type states that we measure, where we take the cell features and then align them against other cell features in hierarchical maps, uh, where we've used five individuals, for instance, or 10 individuals, counted the number of the 20 or 30 or 100 different cell types that are in an individual, and looked at the variation across those individuals, right? Where you find that the variation is not uh, a CV, right? Uh, variation is not an average. You actually find that the level of proteins or cells that go up in one individual actually predicts the other cell types all the way across the system. So just as people have found for a decade or more that there are gene modules, there are cell modules, there are cell feature modules uh, that in, the, in this particular case we found comes together in an immunotherapy that where the cancer is being rejected, the modules form, but when the cancer is not being rejected or with an insufficient or in insufficient uh, um, chemotherapy, the module does not, the modules don't form, right? So this is another level. We need go terms that are more than just what is a gene and what gene motifs does it have and what protein motifs we have. We need functional go terms for cell types, and that's another abstraction level that needs to be incorporated into uh, what we hope will be the, 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 the eventual cell atlas, right? Coordinating cell types. And what was fascinating about this is that the, the modules go from a normal order to a new order that is capable of um, uh, basically getting rid of the cancer. And all that work was done in mouse. We then used it to actually go and figure out what the cell types were Right, this is a paper in Cell earlier this year. This was, this was the cell type, which when transferred into a naive mouse, was actually capable of preventing uh, the cancer from taking root in that mouse when it was challenged. That cell type was predictive in humans. We were able to go to human studies now where there was a different kind of immunotherapy and show that very same cell type 
was actually capable, was the one that was uh, rising in the patients that were responding to the chemotherapy. So these modules of connectivity and correlation are going to be predictive, and they are the biology. These are like the signaling systems coming together inside of a cell, the proteins coming together transiently, the cell populations come together uh, transiently. So at least from the immune system and a mobile system like this, uh, we have to think of mobility and not just place in the, in the body, because the immune system, of course, is mobile. So I'll just, I'll end here by saying that uh, there's another level of understanding that needs to be encoded into this cell atlas. Uh, obviously, it's about how cells come together in a perturbation-specific manner to interact with other cells and what that interaction is across tissue types. Uh, there's all kinds of beautiful opportunity for novel kinds of computational approaches well beyond even the simple stuff that, that my lab has been doing uh, and to find what, the, what that inner meaning is. And I think we need to make sure that we create the, the uh, cell atlas in a manner that allows us to mine and incorporate incorporate prior data. It should be a place where you can go to and link through uh, and find any sort of data that's been there or in the past. Uh, and I think it's really a place to learn about us. Thank you. Shyam Prabhakar from the Genome Institute of Singapore. Uh, Beautiful data, but sorry, this is not a question about your specific uh, presentation, but perhaps for all of the speakers um, earlier so far. So there's so many amazing data sets being generated all over the world, so many different assays, but overlapping cell types and overlapping tissues. So um, how does the HCA decide how to organize all that and decide what data sets are part of the atlas and what are not, or is there even such a decision being made? Right, so uh, I think this is one of the things that was talked about yesterday in that uh, there's obviously going to be a filtering system and if you want to belong to the AHCA, there's going to be a certain number of uh, uh, pr uh, things to which you agree, right? That you will do the data in this kind of uh, a manner. The, here are the quality control standards that you will apply. Here are the ethical standards that you're going to apply, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then upload it, right? Uh, and then it's really, uh, we obviously will not be able to uh, to qualify uh, every data set that comes in. is going to be up to the community at large to do so, but we're going to expect that people hold a certain standards. Uh, at the beginning. And obviously one of the first things that we're going to try to do is to put data sets on there which are exemplars of what we expect, right? And so uh, because those data sets that are such exemplars can then be used as training tools by the computational community to create new ways of understanding the data. So uh, I think that's what's going to go on in probably the first few months, is deciding what kinds of data sets will go on. And again, as Aviv says, it will, be, uh, it will be an iterative process of learning uh, how and what we should put online. 